What is it that juries are supposed to do? In a criminal trial, it is the jury's duty to decide the truth or otherwise of the evidence. Therefore, juries must be impartial. In some jurisdictions, juries must reach a unanimous decision, whereas in others, a majority verdict is accepted. It can be a bit more complicated than that, however. In some places, for some offences, if a unanimous verdict is not possible, a majority verdict can be accepted. In the event that the jury cannot reach a decision, the judge will discharge the jury and a retrial with a new jury may be held, depending on whether the prosecutor thinks there's a reasonable prospect for conviction. Unfortunately, witnesses and victims may be reluctant to testify at retrials, especially when the events they have experienced have been particularly traumatic. So, a jury is used for all cases before courts. Juries are actually used in a minority of cases, but the cases that they are used for tend to be those involving more serious charges and more serious punishments. This is why we are interested in how they make their decisions and the types of things that influence them. We'll return to these questions in a later video. Juries can be used for both criminal and civil trials. In some jurisdictions, such as the United States of America, civil jury trials are relatively common. In other jurisdictions, such as Australia, civil jury trials are actually quite rare and we generally only hear about the criminal jury trials. The makeup of juries can also differ depending on whether the case is a criminal or a civil one. For example, in Australia and the United Kingdom, there are generally 12 jurors for a criminal trial and 4 to 6 for a civil trial. In the United States of America, depending on where the trial is heard, there can be between 6 and 12 members of a criminal jury and likewise for a civil jury. What about other jurisdictions? It's true that juries, as we've been talking about them so far, are only used in a relatively small number of jurisdictions around the world. For example, Australia, the United Kingdom, United States of America, New Zealand and Canada, and more recently in Russia and Spain. In several countries, however, lay people sit on a jury with professional judges. You can find this type of jury in France, Italy and Germany, for example. There have also been some recent trials of this model in Japan and some other countries. Many countries, however, have no community involvement in the determination of guilt uh, for serious criminal matters. Now, the reasons for these differences in community involvement would take some time to explain, but the short version is that they're due in part to the different histories of legal systems around the world and in part due to concerns about the community's input and confidence in the legal system. Valerie Hands wrote an excellent paper in 2008 about legal systems around the world. So if you'd like to read more about this topic, this would be a good place to start. You can also find the reference to her work in the reading list for this video. Now, in the crime you've been hearing about in this course, we're showing you a jury made up of 12 laypersons, which is the model used in Australia. Whether the size of juries matters is something we will come back to when we talk about how juries deliberate. Given that we're using a jury composed of lay jurors in our case, and that a lot of the literature focuses on lay jurors, but many jurisdictions make use of judges as deciders of fact, we need to consider whether there are differences in how lay jurors and judges make their decisions. So, how do juries compare to judges? Neil Vidmar provided a thorough consideration of judges as deciders of fact in his 2011 paper. In that paper, he outlines how legal training and constraints placed on judges by precedents in previous cases contribute to potentially making judges' decision-making different to lay jurors. So having noted some of the difficulties in studying judicial decision making, he turned his eye to what the scientific research says about the decisions of judges compared to jurors. We will return to that very shortly. It's fair to say, however, that some commentators favour judges over jurors as better decision makers. These commentators have a fairly negative view of the ability of juries to carry out their jobs effectively. Impartiality is a capacity of mind, a learned ability to recognise and compartmentalise the relevant from the irrelevant and to detach one's emotions from one's rational facilities. Only because we trust judges to be able to satisfy these obligations do we permit them to exercise power and oversight. But this view that judges are best placed to decide matters of fact in an impartial manner is contradicted by what the scientific research says about this question. Landsman and Rakos's 1994 experiment is probably the best illustration of this point. 
In that study, participants who are either actual judges or regular members of the community were given a hypothetical case to decide. There were three conditions in the study. One where participants were given legally prejudicial and irrelevant information. A second condition where this same information was presented along with a direction to ignore the information because it was inadmissible. And a final control condition where there was no prejudicial information. The results of this study showed that both judges and the community members were negatively influenced by the inadmissible prejudicial information. The instruction to disregard the prejudicial information had little effect on both judges and lay persons. Their verdicts in this condition were more like the verdicts in the condition without the instruction and different from verdicts in the control condition that did not have the prejudicial information. So in sum, this study suggests that both judges and jurors made similar decisions and might be susceptible to the same cognitive biases. And legal training did not seem to protect the judges against these biases. One thing that does favour jurors in this instance, however, is that jurors hear less inadmissible evidence, and also they hear less pre-trial information compared to judges. This places jurors in a situation more like those participants in the control condition in that study that we just heard about. Guthrie and colleagues in 2001 also concluded that judges were vulnerable to most of the cognitive biases that affect lay decision makers when judging legal materials. A later stu study by the same authors in 2005 also found that judges along with jurors were not able to disregard a range of types of inadmissible evidence, but this time there were some exceptions. For example, information about an inadmissible confession was able to be disregarded by judges. A further study in 2009, however, found that judges were just as likely to show evidence of negative stereotypes about black Americans, which affected the sentences given in a series of hypothetical cases. This bias did go away, however, when the judge's attention was explicitly drawn to the defendant's race. These last two studies might lead us to conclude that judges and jurors are not necessarily influenced by the same things, and that judges are more immune to some of the racial stereotypes that jury researchers have demonstrated influence jurors. As Vidmar points out in his 2001 paper, however, these experiments lack much of the detail and impact of real trials. And when actual sentencing data is looked at, there is reasonably consistent evidence that judges on average tend to impose harsher sentences on negatively racially stereotyped groups. Given this, juries may be preferable because it's much easier to remove an apparently biased juror from a case. Also, it's thought that the biases of many jurors may actually end up cancelling each other out. So having said that, let's talk about some of the things that might influence jurors' decisions before the trial. And next week, we'll talk about the way in which jurors make decisions. When we're talking about jurors in this way, we're really talking about whoever is deciding the questions of fact. So most of the research we'll be talking about applies to lay jurors, uh, also potentially applies to how professional judges decide questions of fact.